musician going with Stephanie as uh, she was on the tour. Perfect for each other. See? You know, yes, and that's why it worked out so beautifully with the two of you. But I mean, how do you sort of uh, look at, you know, as you look at her prior to obviously meeting her for the first time and you look at him prior to meeting him for the first time, what were your thoughts? I mean, did you look at her and say, oh, she's gorgeous, you know, I need to meet her. Uh, at the same time, oh, she's very shy, it's hard to talk to, and you the same way with him. Well, I think all the primal instincts were definitely there. I mean, you know, yes. I was definitely attracted. Uh, I think the difficulty was she wasn't looking at me at all. So, oh, that's I, not I, true. <laughs> from a distance, uh, I, I just saw Steph as a person that lived her life uh, certainly differently than I did, uh, quietly, um, gracefully. Uh, but was still purpose and focus and, and, and passion uh, that got expressed in a different way. And so it was always uh, interesting to me uh, from, from a distance. And then the more, of course, you get to know her, the quicker I realize that uh, she's a, a, she lives what she believes every day and, and doesn't, doesn't talk it, you know? I mean, I, I do a lot of talking trying to convince myself that I gotta live a certain way, you know? And she just does it, so it's a, it's a blessing and a half. Well, she, she was always very much, you know, watching her. Obviously, I well retired and, and covering a lot of her matches and so on and so forth. She was always that, you know, elegant German youngster <laughs> that played the tour to perfection, literally. And her work ethic, her, her performance at uh, press conferences, her, her behavior on court. I mean, everything was just exquisite, you know. And, and uh, um, you, you always, always felt that, oh, you know what, she's sort of hard to talk to. You know, you can't get to her or say anything to her that you know, uh, for her to respond. Is that true? You know, I, I'm, I was, you know, definitely shy and definitely not so comfortable um, other than being on the court. I think uh, the, the, life in, the, the life around the courts wasn't something I felt so comfortable. It was just not me being, you know, on the, on the chair answering questions and, and uh, kind of being looked upon. It, it was, um, you know, from early on, I was a more, you know, quiet and reserved and and it takes me a little longer to get to know somebody or to open up to somebody I think I've gotten a little better but he helped me a lot with that <laughs> he's a, you know he's uh, you know he's, he's shown me uh, you know a lot of way a lot of different things a lot of different ways and and I uh, I'm opening up a lot more but yeah it's just I, I think as a especially as a young girl I, I was a bit overwhelmed at the place that I was the last French Open, you won at 29, you won at 30 years old, obviously the most important of your careers because it was sort of at the closing stages of your career if you want to, if you will. Not for but this guy. Not for this guy. No, he then went on he to win several on more. Rolling with it. <laughs> but let's go back one more, one more topic which I wanted to discuss was uh, Wimbledon when both of you won the championships. And, um, you know, there was a tradition of having the Wimbledon ball where the two champions would start out dancing. Uh, for the evening event and apparently you were really looking forward to it <laughs> dancing with her and she was trying somehow to sort of cancel the dance. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Is that true no. or is it... Uh, well, no. Let, let's, let's first set the record straight and say that if the male won Wimbledon, there was a heck of a chance that Stephanie was at the ball because she was for sure winning the women's. I mean, okay. so it she wasn't was a coincidence there. we won at the same time. It was uh, rare for me to win it, but if I won, she was there. But the ball was, um, I guess, something that I always envisioned to be, you know, you, you don't know what it's really like. And I've always heard about this dance that you have with the with the female champion as well and obviously you know Steffi's playing Monica in the finals and I'm praying for Steffi to win and, <laughs> you know and and we get to the ball and um, you know looking forward to it and I don't dance at all but it's still a, to me it would have been enjoyable and um, it was the first year they canceled it the, the Wimbledon cancel it. No, you did, right? did no, you? No, I never, no, I ne no, I never actually never had to dance in 80, in 88, my first win, I never had to dance. Was that just which, a rumor, maybe? No, it was before our, both of our times. Oh. So, when would have been the moment that Andre Agassi said, listen, I really, I really need to meet her one-on-one? -on -one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, was it at Key Biscayne sometime when yeah. Heinz was working with her and, and you wanted to have a hit and that was the easy way to meet? It, it was, I, for me it was, I mean, I was, I was, taken by Steffi back in the early 90s and um, futile efforts to get to meet her and talk to her then. 
but then I, we went on with our lives, and uh, you know, I got married, and I spent uh, a few short years in, 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 a, in, a, in a marriage. And when I was coming out of this, you know, you sit there and you realize so much about yourself when you live a difficult relationship, and you think about what it is you want for your life. And, and so I started to think about this at that stage, and it was before Steph even really knew that I was going to be getting a divorce or anything. So I was trying before she knew I was trying. <laughs> so I was very ahead of the game. You know? So what was your initial reaction when Andre wanted to meet you? He was going to try and set up a meeting, maybe playing tennis, and apparently he ripped off his shirt when he was <laughs> with about to hit with you, you know? Well, you know, um, sort of the, our kind of first kind of um, longer meeting was when we did hit in Key Biscayne earlier in 99 and our coaches kind of set up the whole practice and you know and I, I was like why why does he want to <laughs> practice with me and what I mean you know he's married you know I've got a boyfriend you know it was just like it was all a little confusing to me but I after the practice I found this beautiful bouquet of roses in my hotel room with a beautiful letter and um, um, so we, we had a brief conversation after that where I kind of said that I've got a boyfriend and you know I'm all I know is that he's married I have no idea that he's going through a divorce and I was in a really in a long longer relationship I mean I um, knew where that relationship was heading but you know, I'm seeing a married guy trying to send me roses. She's I'm, seeing a I'm, creep. I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not working. It's yeah. not, not yeah. happening here. Yeah. So um, not till you know a few weeks later, I hear about the um, apparent divorce, and I understand things a little clearer. Now, did you feel the same way when you first saw Andre? Was it love at first sight? Did you find the guy very attractive? Did you find him to be, uh, you know, sort of too out there? You know, he was very much of an extrovert. I was fascinated, absolutely, and. Uh, very interested quickly and attracted very quickly um you know it took us a few months but then everything went really quick no that's wonderful i, I think that uh, uh i think i read somewhere that uh, uh when you all got when you got married just you know, both moms were there and um couple of gardeners or something out in the lawn yeah. and uh, our that's our, amazing our second date lasted 11 years and counting so we're still yeah we Isn't just that wonderful and we got married it was just her mom and my mom and uh, we were doing it at our house in the courtyard and um, I, we I didn't plan and is it. that the way you wanted it you wanted yeah small... we wanted it we wanted it simple you know and that's one thing that Steph taught me a lot in a lot of different ways it's Life is about living. It's not about you know what you say. And what, it's about how you live. And let's just—it was a formality for us. Sort of two wonderful things that uh, I kind of uh, heard about or read about was the fact that one, you all had a crate of uh, 1989 wine for your for your wedding, and then you tend to keep that same crate of wine, and you have one on every anniversary. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah, Becheville. Becheville. Chateau yeah, Becheville. Nineteen. It was the uh, first time we went out, our first date we went out. I didn't realize that I thought everybody likes to have wine, you know. I thought everybody likes it. I didn't realize Steffi wasn't a wine kind of go out, have three, four course meal kind of gal, you know. <laughs> so I made all the wrong decisions. I said, well, we'll order a bottle of wine. And I ordered, you know, the best bottle I could find. And, and I ordered it to the, and she didn't sip any of it. and because she doesn't drink wine, so, so then we... Very uh, unusual for a German, right? True, true, think. yeah, alcohol wasn't something that I enjoyed too much, but I do enjoy now a glass of red wine. <laughs> Obviously, it was a big move for you to come from Germany to Las Vegas, you know, I mean, coming to America is one thing, coming to Las Vegas is quite a different, you know, kettle of fish altogether. Uh, Andre, you know, it was a great move to be able to bring her family here, you know. Very strategic. That was, that was a very strategic move that was. It was yeah, standpoint. it was. It was very strategic. <laughs> you know, it is a culture shock, unquestionably. Yeah. When, when people ask me how does Steph lo like Vega, I said, well, she loves me unbelievable. You know, she loves me a lot. That's, so in life, it's not where you live. It's, it's who you live with, you know, and we have family here. Uh, having us all together makes a, makes a big difference. And there's a lot to appreciate about Vegas. I don't want to 
and I, I promise this is a culture of a can-do society. There, there's people here. This city is built in the middle of a desert. People believe that they can accomplish things. And there's a, there's a power and a culture here. And there's some beauty with the mountains around. There's a lot of things. And it kind of gets over sensationalized, the, the, the other parts of Las Vegas. But it does offer a lot. But nothing offers more than the people that you spend your life with. And, and that's what we're blessed to have. We don't go out of our way to encourage tennis. Uh, if they chose it, we would take a deep breath. It's not easy. You've lived it yourself, VJ, with, with your son and what he's accomplished. And, uh, it's a tough road, you know. Today, Andre Agassi and Steffi Graf's world revolves around their two children, Jaden Gill and Jazz Ellie. And it's not their celebrity tennis star status that keeps them so busy, but just being normal parents. Kids. Yes. Now, obviously, you know, Steffi's pregnant. We're going to have a third child. No, I'm kidding. No. I'm just a joke. <laughs> you got me there completely off guard. Sorry. Something I didn't. We wanted to announce it right here. No. No, no. no that's, not, that's not true. Two, only two. You've got two wonderful, a boy and a girl, and uh, Jaden Gill, who you named after Gill, Grace, who's been a very big part of your life during the course of your tennis career. A little bit about Gil. Gil is uh, my trainer of 19 years as a professional still. We still work together, but he is uh, my surrogate father. He was a professor for me. He was a teacher. He was a leader. Um, he, he taught me that I'm worth, I'm worth caring about, and uh, I'll, never, uh, I'll never lose appreciation for his guidance in my life. Made, a lot of th made my dreams possible. And your son is named after Jaden. Jaden Gill. Yeah, I named him Jaden Gill because Steph and I talked about it and we both concluded that if Jaden grows up to be half the man that, that Gill is, we will be very proud. And if I can be half the father uh, that he is or that he's been to me, um, then, then I would be also really proud. So uh, we just felt it was appropriate to connect it all together. Jazz, your daughter. Two years later, three years later? Two year, almost uh, two years later, both October children. Keeps your hands full? Absolutely, sure, sure do. But you know, this is the, um, the beautiful thing about also the, the, the choices that we have with um, tennis. You know, we, we got a chance to be with our kids now. We, we have a career, we're doing different things almost as a second career, but our, our priority is clearly our children. And, you know, we, we, we can be at their baseball games and we can choose to be there to help at school and uh, see them grow up. Is it a conscious decision on both your parts that either one of them or neither one of them would play tennis? Well, I think it's fair to say that a child uh, gets exposed to some different things and a parent can can encourage things in certain ways, and, and, and we don't go out of our way to encourage tennis. Uh, if they chose it, we would take a deep breath. It's not easy. You've lived it yourself, VJ, with, with your son and what he's accomplished, and uh, it's a tough road, you know? So, and you know the road so intimately, so the difficulty as a parent who's lived this life and this career is do you really want to watch your child go through this experience where you, you know what they're in for uh, before they even do it. And, and I, from a selfish perspective, I don't want to. You know, I, I, I want to share that experience with them. I don't want to know what they're in for. You know? So uh, to say we, 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 would not, we would never decide for them, but we, we don't go out of our way to really encourage it. So do you have any specific uh, dreams for the, for, the, for the kids? We want them to learn empathy. My hope is, is that their empathy plays out in a way that whatever they end up doing in life, they do it and make a difference to somebody else in the process, you know, add to somebody else's experience. Because that's, that's the best experience, is when you can change the experience of someone else. And so that's what I hope. Whatever they end up doing is one thing. Who they end up Who being they is, what I, is what I dream about. You know, there's a few trips that we've been talking about now that our kids are old enough that we want them to experience with us, and India's been clearly one of them that we've talked a lot about.
Today, more than their achievements in tennis, Steffi Graf and Andre Agassi are known for their philanthropic endeavors. In 2001, Agassi opened the Andre Agassi College Prep Academy in Las Vegas, a tuition-free charter school for actress children in the area. Agassi himself calls it the biggest achievement of a ninth grade dropout. You started this in 1994 with Agassi Foundation and then led on to the prep college here, the academy here. Uh, uh, you know, obviously it has grown in leaps and bounds over the last 10 years. Uh, obviously, I mean, is there anything else you could possibly do here? Would, would you want to add even more students? You have about 1,000, 1,100 students now. We think we're going to have 13, 1,400 kids here, ultimately. Um, and the sad part is, as Steph says, there's still this need. The waiting list has over 2,000 kids just for this school. So uh, that's been my pain. Uh, you know, it's been hard raising. I've raised probably $150 million of philanthropy.